Shalom, Chavri Imam Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. We have a very interesting program this evening, and this here is about a young man, 15 year old young man. His name is Nathan. I don't have his last name here. He's here at a shul in Israel. He is a native Israeli. He actually was clinically dead for 15 minutes uh, just back here only about a month or so ago in an uh, incredible story indeed that he tells. Now, if you get the, un, um, there, there is several versions here. We will actually be making the one that we're going to be looking at now available on Israeli News Live on our uh, page there uh, in Facebook. If you want to look at this video here, this is only about 40 minutes of the video that is actually translated into English. His testimony, though, is two hours long. Uh, he speaks about being in heaven, into, in a place, standing there, being accused for good and for evil, seeing his entire life story flash before his eyes, uh, or like on a movie screen, so to speak, and all kinds of things that he actually gets to see. Now, I can't authenticate yes or no on every single thing that he speaks about to say, is this actually biblical or is it not? Uh, and so therefore, I won't take a, an opinion on this particular point here, but clearly, even for a Jewish young man, I can see clearly biblical signs that he is going to speak, especially when he gets near the end of his speech, that are obviously very accurate uh, and may shock you to know the events that are about to take place in the world today. Well, many of us know that we are on the precipice of a man momentous event that is about to happen. And this young man here was a secular Jewish young man. And of course, he's in a shul, so he's wearing a kippah now. But from his own testimony, and those that know him know, he never studied in a yeshiva, which is a Jewish religious school. He never was a part of, of anything that would be remotely considered uh, religious and growing up. He just grew up as a secular Jewish boy living in Israel, having fun with his friends, 15 years old. And he died while in the hospital. He's very sick when he went in. He actually was clinically dead, according to the doctors, for 15 minutes. And he said it seemed like a long time where he was at. He got to see what many Christians had described in their near-death experiences of heaven and hell. He got to see the place in different levels. He speaks about levels of heaven. They ask him, who's in the highest level? He said, that's where God is. Uh, it's very interesting to listen to all of this, but we're going to focus on the last portion of it here. Uh, I'm actually beginning you in about 28 minutes of this broadcast here. I'll share with you the subtitles here that are on here, and you can watch it for yourself. You can get to see more of it. Uh, most of what we have, even in the English language, he talks about what it's like, the different places he was taking, especially one of the things that I thought was very fascinating was is that it, he said, God doesn't look at you whether or not you're religious. He's looking to see if there's holiness. And he said, those good things you do in life are huge in heaven. But he said, so are the bad things. And he said, those things are weighed out. So very interesting to say the least. And one of the things he focuses at here in the very end of the message is repentance. That was something else I thought was fascinating. And I think you'll find something very fascinating to about the testimony. Let's take a look at a little bit of this here. Uh, I just began at about 28 uh, minutes here. He says, he says, according to what I understood, let me actually, let me take you right back just a second here before it changes there. Um, he says, I understand according to what I understood there. He's speaking about where he was at. I am certain that I know it. When I was up there, I understood what was going to happen in the world. Okay, now he makes that statement right there. Then it goes on and he continues on as the rabbi listens on. Of course, the rabbi will ask him a lot of questions. He says, according to what I understood, what I told you about Mashiach and everything, I also understood that the, that the gula, gula, by the way, is the word, a Hebrew word for redemption, and the revelation of the Mashiach is going to happen very soon. Well, Christians believe that as well. I find that interesting. All right, so he says, going to happen very soon. That's something that's definitely not. It's like it's going to happen in the very near future. It's imminent. It's like imminent. The gula is really coming. 
Again, gula is redemption. It's the Hebrew word for redemption. So he said, it's coming. And the rabbi asked him, now tell me, when you were there, there was no conception of time. How can you estimate that there, the, there the concept time? See, what is imminent? Is it 20 years? Uh, two years? A month? See, he, the rabbi asked him that. He said, imminent is right away, like in the coming months. Okay, now, uh, he goes on, uh, the rabbi, rabbi asked him in the question, in the coming months? Now, mind you, this, I don't believe that he's looking at this to be exact. It's what he's trying to believe from the perception of what he understood, because he speaks about in, the, in this timing here that he talks about there. He said, I don't know how I know these things. I just understand these things. It's like you, you he said, even he describes it. When you're there, you can see behind you, in front of you, the sides of you, everything. He said, you just know what's happening and what's going on. But I do realize that, yes, that redemption is only months away. But we also know there's a lot of things that are going to happen in the coming months. Israel's redemption also includes two witnesses. Now, as he speaks about these things, you're going to find out, ironically, he mentions that but he doesn't realize what he's mentioning. Let's listen on here, or look on what he says here. So the question comes in, uh, he says, now, do you also know what will happen, is the question that Rabbi asked him. Yes, I know what is going to happen. Yes. And you know that from, you know that from there. He's trying to establish where he knows it from. He says, yes, only from there. Everything I know is only from there. Because you have to understand, he was never, never uh, taught anything secular. He says, and where, where are we uh, holding right now? In other words, where are they at right now? What's taking place now? But by the way, those of you that may wonder what he's holding on to, uh, they're sitting in a little cubicle right there. There's, a, there's both uh, the, the men, Jew, Jewish men on the bottom floor there, and there's an upper balcony where the women are at there in the in the shul that he is actually at. And uh, they're sitting in front of like a little uh, organ or a piano or something like that. And he's sitting there messing around with the music rack. It took me a little bit to figure that out myself. So anyway there, so he says, well, he's wanting to know what's going on right now. So he says, where are we holding now? In a period, not a good one at all, at all. Like I can tell you that the redemption is very close to here. And he says, and what will happen during the redemption? He said very bad things are going to happen, but it depends on who, as far as I understood, he says. Then he says, man, uh, man from the audience, it, it is certain, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that one there. It is certain uh, it will occur in the coming months. That's what a man actually, he's asking the question, and he affirms that yes, it's going to happen in the coming months. Is there perhaps the possibility that it won't happen, is what he's stating there. Now, now, what he's actually speaking about, because you have to kind of watch everything to, to really understand what he's asking that question there, is if the people were willing to repent, because he's, he's speaking about things that are bad things that are actually going to happen. All right, so that's something there that we have to understand. He says there is, there is that possibility if we repent, it won't happen. And of course, like I said, he goes into to, to the uh, technicality of, of uh, if we would only repent, things would be different. So that's what he's speaking about there. Now he also talks about the mitzvot. Mitzvot is good deeds, doing things that are good. If you remember biblically, what would we look at as being mitzvot? What would we look at as good deeds? Remember what God says in his word? Do not oppress the widow and things of this nature here. Remember the man Cornelius that had came up, his alms had, been, had come up before the Lord. See, his giving, his kindness. It wasn't something that was publicly done. And we know that works does not get you into heaven. But the thing is, is God does expect us to show kindness and love here on this earth, to say the least. All right, so let's move on right here. He said the redemption will be, uh, he, said, he says, but if they commit transgression, the redemption will be less pleasant. In other words, if the redemption, and he's talking about the redemption of Israel, by the way, when he's speaking of this right here. The rabbi says, if they commit transgression, will come to pass in a much more difficult manner. Nathan, much more difficult, yes. And if everybody repents, it will come, come to pass in an easy way. And unfortunately, not everybody is willing to repent. We can see that clear. We know that's clearly the way it is. The rabbi says, but it's, 
But he says it's going to happen no matter what. He's talking about the redemption of Israel. Now, you're going to find out in here, not everyone that claims to be Jewish is going to make it. See, redemption, God is coming to redeem those that are willing to repent. And again, I have a feeling as you watch uh, little brother Nathan here, as you watch the things that he shares with us here, he's looking at this happening over a course of months, but yet there's certain things that must fulfill biblically that will take a little bit longer than a few months to fulfill, but it will be in months. And if we look at the, the ministry of the two witnesses, one of the things that I have believed myself is that once their ministry is finished, this is when judgment sets in. And according to what this young man sees here, that's exactly what happens. So it's not like in some of the theology that is out there today in the Christian circles. Many people are believing in a seven-year tribulation. The Antichrist gets three and a half. The two witnesses get three and a half. The rapture goes up, etc. But I shared with you in a video not too long ago, the bride is going to see the ministry of the two witnesses. Because why? How can God get his bride in order when there's all different kinds of schisms and isms in Christianity? He's going to get her in order by bringing, like, the, like his apostles asked him, doesn't the scripture say that Elias must first come? And he said, truly Elias shall first come and restore all things. That was in the future tense. That's, in, that's clearly written right in the Gospels. And even those of you that may be looking at some of the uh, Gospels that are not in the current canon today, it's the same thing is written there as well. Elijah must come and restore all things first. Something then is not right. See, we, we, we think automatically in our mind that when the Messiah came, Yeshua, when he came, he restored all things. And he did. But he also knew that man would totally get everything out of cater and, out of, and, and completely out of whack. All right. Now, keep in mind, we shared with you yesterday on the news broadcast yesterday that the United States now is backing Obama to send troops into Syria as well as into Europe. And I told you, Obama's going to end up provoking a war in his actions. Russia's not going to sit back idle about this. But you also got to realize, too, even though America provokes a war with Russia, in their actions, there's still got to come a time where they all unite together and come against Israel. Because the Bible says clearly all nations will come against Israel. So there's also got to be a uniting time. And of course, everybody wants Israel. Like I said the other day, the United States wants it because why? They want the oil that's in the Gulf there. Even uh, uh, the, uh, the, the gas, the oil company there, that uh, Nobel, that is actually a U.S.-backed company there, they will not sign a contract with Israel for another year. And Obama has refused to acknowledge that, uh, that Israel has a right to the Golan. Vladimir Putin is in Syria there because why he wants the Golan for himself. He wants Syria. He wants the oil there. He wants the West Bank because he signed a contract worth millions of dollars. He's got a lot of rich people that he has got to make sure they get what they want. The United States wants it as well. They have been siding with Israel as far as that goes. But again, John Kerry has a lot of feet dug into the ground along with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Abbas is willing to sell it to anybody, doesn't care who it is, let just everybody give us a little bit of money. Of course, John Kerry also has millions invested in the oil company of the U.S. that is willing to sign the deal with Israel, but again, on hold. Now the U.S. is looking at sending troops into Syria, saying it's the only way to take care of ISIS. Well, what's really going to happen? Well, they'll get into a war between themselves, between them and Russia. And then after that battle goes on for a while, then they'll turn their attention to Israel. And they'll all come against Israel to take this land for themselves. And the Vatican, of course, wants Jerusalem. All right, let's continue on into this right here. Uh, we're getting to the first part here. He's, one of the things he's going to say, everyone will fight against each other because they want it. What do they want? They're wanting Jerusalem is what he's going to be speaking about. So the rabbi asked, now, according to what you know there, what you saw there, how is it going to happen? It's going to be according to what I understood. Right now, our situation is not good at all. I mean, not good, he says. What's going to happen, the rabbi asked. It's going to be something that is called a very big war. Everybody, the whole world will be involved in that war according to what I understood. There's your World War III. 
exactly what we're looking at happening. The whole world will simply be involved in that war. Everybody, all the Goim, all the Arabs, and everybody will come against the nation of Israel and will fight in, uh, in that war, is what he's speaking of right there. All right? See, they're all going to fight. We're looking. I mean, we're really seeing Ezekiel's war as well line up in this scripture uh, as far as a scriptural war, and he's going to speak about that as well. He says, Nathan says, it will begin. The person who will start the war will be somebody uh, named Gog, as far as I understood up there. Only up there I understood. Now, what he speaks about right here is probably going to be controversial with some people. This young man actually identifies Gog as President Barack Obama. And I know many people would probably figure that it's Putin that is actually Gog because we think of that as from the land of the north. And everybody automatically assumed that the land of the north is anything north of Israel. Of course, the United States is in the northern hemisphere. But many of the Christians of America have always stood with Israel. So I can't say yes or no in this case here. But nonetheless, the events that you're about to hear him speak about are going to shock you, to say the very least. So let's take a look at what he says here. Anyway, so he goes on to say, as I understood it up there, I can only understand. Rabbi, he says, Gog, he says, do you know who this Gog is? I am certain of who it is. Who is it? He asked. President Obama, the young man states. Rabbi, he will start Gog and Magog. He will be the one who starts that war. Now, even if we take and consider the fact that, okay, Russia is actually Magog or, or Gog or whatever we want to say, the clear implications here is that the one that starts the war is President Barack Obama. Now, I won't say that the U.S. is Gog or Magog myself. I, I can't say that. I can only see what the young man here says here. But one thing I will say that I can agree with him on 100%, will, will Obama start it? It's very clear from the things that have happened over the last couple of years that, yes, Obama will start the war. We saw in one news article that came out, Russia exposed it about America's plot to actually nuke Moscow. They were trying to get the upper hand on Russia by putting a nuclear or, or strike, doing the first uh, strike on Russia with a nuclear bomb. But the woman, who was an American, um, uh, American a high-ranking official in America that was on the plane that had the codes, refused to release the codes. She was court-martialed, and as far as I know, still in prison in a in a military prison for not divulging the codes because it takes more than one person to divulge the codes. And she would not want to start the war with Russia. So she was relieved of her duties. That, that is even in American news, but it doesn't tell you the real reason behind it. Russia reveals that it was because the U.S. and Britain were planning on doing a first strike on Russia. This was during the time that it was really at the hottest point with Ukraine. Now we see that Russia has military forces there. America has not been very cooperative with Russia on fighting ISIS. They're showing a little tiny cooperation. U.S. sends in special forces into the uh, northern Syria. And now we see that the United States is talking about sending troops both into Syria as well as into Europe. It is definitely a provocation against Russia. Will it end up in a major war there in the Middle East starting off there? As this young man here is saying that it will happen? No doubt that it will. And by the way, everything that he's speaking about here, this is all recorded before all these things, all these developments we're seeing now. We had, no, we had no proof that Obama was planning on sending troops back to the Middle East. So that's something of interest to say the very least there. So anyway, he says he'll start the war. He will bring his whole army. He will start the war here. You see, that's the statement I'm talking about right there. When this video was made, there was nobody in the United States talking about sending troops into Syria. They were, in fact, they were emphatic that they would never send troops into Syria. They would only do it with an air campaign. 
Now, the U.S. Bar President Barack Obama has said that there would be a need for more forces and the 50 special forces he sent in there. And the U.S., uh, the different congressmen and senators are willing to back him on sending in more troops and doing so. It's been going like wild in the news there, as well as sending a huge contingent of troops to Europe to, to protect Europe from Russia, Russian aggression on uh, the European side. So could the young man be right when he says, he says he will bring his whole army, he will start the war here? Watch what else he says here. He goes on, the rabbi says, and he will fight against us? He says, yes, he will fight against us. At first, everyone will simply want the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, Israel, everyone will want it. That's pretty obvious already as well. The Vatican wants it, Abbas wants it, America wants it. All the Arabic nations want Jerusalem. Russia wants it because they have an interest there as well. So truly, everyone wants Jerusalem. <laughs> That's an understatement to say the least. Uh, so he goes on, Jerusalem, yes, everyone will want, uh, will want it. The whole world is going to want it says, they won't pay any attention to us. They simply want it. Everyone will fight against each other because they want it. That's what starts the war in the Middle East. As we've been speaking about all along, and not just here, there's been many other news sources out there, especially those that are into prophecy that know that the Gog and Magog war is all about the spoil or the oil in this region here. They're all wanting this for that very purpose there. And this is why we see a war about ready to break out to say the least. He says, so anyway, it says, not, he says it won't be long at all as far as this war. Then he says that all that, all the bad things will take, uh, it will only take about two weeks. Now, this is the war between the U.S. and Russia that's being fought there in the, in the Middle East there before they attack Israel. He said it'll be about a two-week war. Now, keep in mind, when we look at that being a two-week war, it still takes time for the U.S. to get their troops there. That's all got to come to pass. It does take some time. Even when America was planning on attacking Saddam Hussein, it took time. Now, in the meantime, while the United States begins to put their forces together, somewhere along the way, very soon, the two witnesses have to come on the scene. Something as drastically is about to happen here in the Middle East. And the reason why I say that it's because if this is going to be like a two-week battle there when they start slugging it out with each other. He's also going to get into it a little bit about these two men that are dead, that were raised from the dead. That comes along as well. And I know the U.S. could send in troops pretty quickly, but normally it takes a little bit more time to do that. The transporting, putting in the armor, and all that kind of good stuff. So although he's trying to... to recollect what he has seen in heaven and what he has saw that's going to happen. And you have to keep in mind when he was looking at this, and I'm not sure exactly the date of when the video was made itself. All this happened, I believe, back in, uh, it was actually on, um, I think it's the first day of Sukkot is when this young man had his near-death experience. So we've had time already, has already passed already, but yes, we are seeing things rapidly build. And even like you said, if you looked at the couple of months, now, within that couple of months already, they're already talking about sending in troops. So things are moving along rather rapidly, to say the least. So the rabbi asks, all the bad things will take two weeks. What will happen during those two weeks? What, what, what are the bad things? The rabbi is asking uh, Nathan, this young man, this 15-year-old young Jewish boy. He says, in those two, th two weeks, what is the bad thing? More than a few million people will die. They will die like, and he goes on to say here, the only thing that saves them, what I understand, is only if they repent. This is something that really struck me right here when he actually states this right here, that more than a few million people will die, and the only thing that will save them is if they repent. That's amazing. Now, he speaks here, if a person learns Torah, performs acts of kindness, that's what will save him from, from this thing. Repenting is the key. As a Christians, we could translate Torah into studying the Word of God. 
you know, having our minds about doing good things. And does not even is it not even written in the New Testament as well? I'll show you my works by my faith. Or, <laughs> you see, so the thing is, we're not talking about you make your way into heaven by works, so to speak. But clearly, even Jesus clearly said. You let off, let off the, the greater things that matter the most. The needy, the widow. These are what we're speaking about when we talk about works. Acts of kindness to the everyday human being. I could go even further with that, but just to give you a little bit of an idea there. okay. So, as we move on down, he says, the rabbi asks the question, so, uh, no, he's, I'm sorry, the rabbi is actually going to talk about things that are in the, the Sanhedrin, uh, these are things like uh, from Talmudic uh, expressions from the rabbis that are there. Um, I don't think this is what God is looking for. In fact, when you listen to this young man here, you're going to find out that that type of being religious is not what God is looking for. Okay? He said, it'll be a, he said at first there's going to be a war between soldiers. The whole world will simply come. And we are seeing that. He mentions about Iran too, by the way. He says, simply at the first, all the Goim will battle each other and will want Israel in the end. That's what they're all going there for in the first place now as it is. China, every one of them. He even talks about South Korea getting involved in this battle, which is another thing I thought was very interesting. He says, what will happen in this? Everyone will, will unite and fight against us, fight against the nation of Israel. That's after they've done duped it out and come to a, to a compromise over who's going to get what in Israel as they rip the country apart. You know, you know, in fact, let me tell you something. This is something I've never thought about before until just now. You know how we look at the Bible, God says in the prophecy, those that are dividing my land. God is angry over the fact they've divided Israel. Maybe it's not a division of a Palestinian state and a Jewish state. Maybe the division is because after two weeks of war, killing millions of people in the world over this battle here in the Middle East, over the fighting over Israel, maybe the division is the fact that these nations compromise with each other and they divide the land of Israel up saying, okay, you'll get this part, we get this part here, you'll get this all riches, we get that all riches, and the Vatican gets Jerusalem and we'll all be happily ever after. Remember what it says in Ezekiel's prophecy? I believe, no, Ezekiel or Jeremiah? I think no, it's Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 35, I believe it is. What does Ezekiel say? These two nations. See? And that's because the Vatican's already divided it. All right? He says, Thus will I make Malsier most desolate and cut off from him that passeth in and, and him that returneth. This is in Ezekiel 35, chapter, uh, chapter 35, verse 7, verse 8. And I will fill his mountains with his slain men and thy hills and thy valleys and all thy rivers shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I think that's the battle this young man sees. See? And I will make thee a perpetual desolation and the cities shall not return and you shall know that I am the Lord because thou hast said... These two nations, these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. Now, you're going to find out in a minute, this man is going to tell you when that judgment comes. And it lines up with not only Ezekiel's prophecy, but it lines up with Revelation 11. Let me first read to you what it says here in the scripture in Ezekiel. Because you're going to find out. It's fascinating. Fast. This young man doesn't even know it. But he's going to know it. It says, And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all these blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Thus with your mouth you have boasted against me, and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. They are laid desolate. That means Israel is going to be flat out nearly annihilated from what the word says here in Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 35. This young man is going to tell you that too. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, will I will make thee desolate. 
according to Revelation 11, when the whole earth rejoices at the death of the two witnesses. They send gifts one to another, and the whole earth rejoices over the death of these two witnesses. We'll read it in just a second. And thou didst rejoice in the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all of Edomia, even all of it. They shall know that I am the Lord. So see, God, Israel's going to be desolate, but then God's going to bring desolation upon all of uh, Rome and her soldiers and all those who have conspired together, including Russia that have come against it. Now, let's go over here to Revelation 11. And just by chance, if this little brother ever watches this, maybe it'll click to him as well. He says, I give power unto my two witnesses. That's Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. 2,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's in the book of Zechariah. See, but watch what happens. After they do all the miracles and stuff, they give their testimony, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. See? And they of the people and the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. According to this young man, they'll be right there on the Mount of Olives dead. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall sing gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. All right? So when God brings the judgment, it's when they're killed. Right after they, they first they got to rejoice and God's going to judge them. But the two witnesses go up. Let's, let's watch more what he says here, what's going to happen. So you can see the prophetic side of all of this. And many people from, uh, from Israel will die. Several million people will die. A ton of people will die. That's what I've been telling you, friends, all along. Micah's prophecy clearly shows you're in travail, O Israel. You'll be forced out of the city. All right? The rabbi asked, those who didn't keep Torah and mitzvot, he says, they will die. And those uh, who keep Torah misvote, and they, those who keep Torah misvote, he said, it depends. Now, this is what I like that was very interesting. He said, it depends. In other words, just because you're religious, doesn't, that's not what God's looking for. He said, it depends. If they did Torah with uh, Gimelot, uh, uh, Chadassim, in other words, did they do it with a true devotion? It's the same thing with Christianity. Do you just do it out of fear? Or, or, or what's your real purpose behind it? See, he said, those that are observant, but they don't really care about it. They are casual about it. You know, he's talking about people that just look religious. But if someone is really strict, studies Torah and does acts of kindness, and he will, he will be saved. All right? Now, you have to understand, he's looking at this from, from his own perspective. But what I see, when I look at this young man and what he's seeing right here and trying to explain, you have to understand, he's a Jewish young man. He... It is true that God is coming to redeem the Jews, but he's also looking at this as from the perspective of sincerity of heart. So when you look at this, my friends, don't judge this young man and say, oh, that can't be right because he's just talking about studying Torah and everything, and we know that God doesn't go by the law. You know, I agree that God doesn't go by 613 laws of, uh, of Leviticus. I agree with that. Because even Yeshua spoke about how that you could, or David says you can write the laws of God on the bedpost. If they can be written on the bedpost, you're not going to get 613 laws on the bedpost. But what this young man is clearly making clear to, to, to the people that are there in Israel is it's that sincerity of heart. This is, what is, this is what matters in what he is saying here. Okay, It's the sincerity of heart. This is what matters. He says, uh, but anyway, so, so the young man continues on. What will happen is like this, according to what I saw up there. He says, what do you mean you saw? And he tells the people, it was like a movie. He says, I see it like a movie. He says, it's just mere seconds, but it's a, it's a lot of time. He says, like the movie of my life that I saw, they, they showed me my life in a thousandth of a second. Like in a thousandth of, of a second, they showed to me. He speaks about how they showed him when, they, when he was born, as he grew up, young man, everything. See, saw all of that. But then he sees this. He says, so let's, the rabbi says, let's move forward. He saw it like a mute movie, the future, what's going to be. And he agrees, I saw it like that. He said, everyone was attacking Israel, and they came against us, and they fought against us. And this is what's going to be surprising to many. Watch what he speaks about here. The idea, if that is, we'll manage to, to keep them at bay for two days, according to what I saw. 
and then everyone will simply kill us, and we won't have anyone to rely on but the Holy One. Blessed be He. And then what will happen is suddenly, see? Now the rabbi is going to stop him. He said the IDF will only hold out for two days. Two days, friends. Now, I have a feeling, this is my own thought in here, God is probably letting him see a section here, a section there, and a section there. Like I said, it'll take Obama a little bit of time to get all of his forces over there because he's got to fight Russia. Russian troops are going to come down as well. They're all going to mobilize their troops in there. This is going to be over the next months as the time goes by. Your two witnesses have got to come on the scene at any time now then in order to begin to start dealing with Israel as well, something that will cause them to repent, maybe even to deal with the Christian world as well, to get them to repent, because the whole world hates them anyway. All right? But see, God is showing him the redemption of Israel. It's what he's showing them. And the redemption of Israel comes when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Right? All right. So he says that. He says two days. And after two days, we will be finished by then. Is what he says. No IDF. He says, no IDF. So everything is, is open. He says, everything is open. It's exposed, unprotected. So you say that Gog is Obama. Obama is the United States. You say that he will lead uh, the war. Is what he's getting at. He's not saying the war yet. He said he will lead the whole war. And who will join him? He says he will join him. Iran will join him. The UN, the whole UN. See? Yes, Russia, South Korea, the whole UN, really, every, everyone, everyone, all 70 nations will rise uh, against us. 70. You remember one thing I said many times before, how could you get all the nations of the world in there to fight against Israel? I've said this many times over the last couple of, two or three years, in fact. The only way to get all the troops there against Israel is to bring a united nation force against them. And that's certainly going to be something that we see happen. Okay? That may even come within as well. And then, of course, you ask about ISIS. He said, ISIS, they will be kidnapping the people there and torturing the people. That's something that he speaks about as well uh, that, that will happen, that will go on. All right? Now, I've made several notes here, so I kind of want to Follow here where I'm at here. All right. Then he says, he said, I saw the Har Hatzim, that's the Mount of Olives, by the way, or the Mountain of Olives, next to Jerusalem. It will, those who have uh, the merit to be saved, so that mountain will split in two. Now watch what he says. This is very fascinating to me right here. And the moment that the mountain splits in two, in that second, the Mashiach will be revealed to everyone, meaning before everyone, before everyone. Okay, he makes that clear that the Messiah is going to appear before everyone. Everyone will simply see that it's the Messiah. Will understand it is Mashiach. Here he is, revealed to everyone. All right, that's that's fascinating, friends. And he will stand at the entrance there to Haratzaim, and he will say, "Who can enter and who cannot?" That's going to get interesting when he brings all this out right here. All right. Anyone who doesn't have the merit to enter will stay outside and die. Okay? And anyone who has the merit, he can go in. You have to understand what he will be saved from in a minute. I'll explain this to you, the young man says. So it's like whoever, so the, so the mountain simply opens. And also, the rabbi asks, how does it open? And he's going to ask, is it open because it splits in two? Is it an earthquake? Is it a nuclear bomb? And of course, Nathan says, no, 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 no. It's not that. He says, what? Watch what he says. No, they will rise up. You know how on Harhatsrim, on the Mount of Oz, there are graves, right? Watch what he says. Uh-huh. So two of the dead people will arise. Two dead people will come back to life, one from here and one from here, and it will split in two. Do you realize that? Two dead people will rise. This is one reason why I say, when I look at what this young man is speaking about, it is obvious 
he's catching the glimpses of the different segments of these things that are going to transpire over the next two or three years here. And the thing is, I'm even wondering, are we going to recognize when the two witnesses come on the scene? Or is it going to be so subtle that they're here and the ministry starts already and we don't even realize it? Is it the fact that it gets greater and greater and greater? That's another question. You know, in fact, when I looked at the book of Enoch, Enoch actually speaks of one of them. And he talks about a horn that rises up amongst their brethren. And that horn gets greater and greater until finally... Because he does it in the likeness of animals. He does it as a sheep. He says that ram, he said he cries out unto God. And God reveals all to him. That's Elijah restoring the word of God. All right? So anyway, he says he will come back to life. One from here and one from there. So the two dead people will rise. Two dead people will come back to life. One from here, one from there, here. And it will split in two. The two dead people coming back to life cause that mountain to split? Of course. Because you've got to remember, the two witnesses, they come and they preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. And in their own death and resurrection, three and a half days laying in the street, they proved that cr truly Yeshua was laying in the street or buried in the grave. And their resurrection is a proof that he did. And of course, when Yeshua, when he was crucified and when he died, the earth did quake and the veil was rent in twain. By the way, I've never said this to you guys yet. Something the Lord revealed to me recently about that. You know, the, that veil represents to your heart so that he could come in and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Anyway, though, when they raise up, the earth trembles again and opens up. I believe it's like opening up a, a, a dimension from here into heaven as the Mount of Olives opens up like that. Watch what he says about the Messiah, though. He says, and what I saw simply that the Mashiach, first of all, someone who can't, he's someone who can't sin, someone uh, who, who, he says, who repented. And I think that's just in his own analysis. But he said, who didn't commit any transgression. This is what fascinates me right here is when he says that. He didn't commit any transgression. And the rabbi says he repented. He said, he, yes, he, did, he, he didn't, watch what he says, he didn't commit any transgression. He didn't commit any transgression since he repented. He didn't uh, commit uh, even one transgression. Mm. He didn't commit any transgressions. That's amazing to me. All right. Now, he says it can't be that the Messiah is someone who committed transgression or transgressions. Isn't that interesting? He said the Messiah is someone who, who, could, who he couldn't be a person that committed transgressions. You know, friends, the only one that I know of that didn't commit transgressions in this earth is Yeshua. And whether or not God revealed that to him or not, I don't know. But watch what he says about him. It's interesting. Now, it can be someone who actually... Oh, excuse me, he says, now, it can be someone who we actually know very well. Who we know very well, he says. Lots and lots of people know him according to what I understood. But everyone will be very, very surprised that he is, of all people, the Mashiach. And who is the only one that can fit that particular category? It's Yeshua. Because many, many people know him. And the Jews know him as well. But they are going to be surprised. Let's also know that the, this Mashiach, I mean the Mashiach, he will fight against Obama. That's, I thought that was kind of interesting as well. Now, the, the funny thing is, he's going to talk about that he's going to overcome him, he'll kill him, and that he will actually bury him in the land of Israel. But I will say this, we do know from the scripture that that is true. Uh, that is actually true that, one, the mountain splits. We know that from the book of Zechariah. Uh, and that's Zechariah 14, 14, for those of you that, that, that are not aware of that. Uh, we also know from the prophet Ezekiel uh, that, yes, God will be buried there. They will actually be buried there in Israel. We see that about the seven years uh, of them being buried. He says, watch what he says, he says, what he sees. He sees according to, uh, now this young man says he, that he sees, talking about the Messiah, he sees according to holiness. See, Messiah sees according to holiness. Do you not know that the scripture says, even, even uh, in the book of Hebrews, I believe it is, well, I got a note on that. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. He says what he will see is, he sees according to a person's holiness. 
He says he can smell each person. He will smell if someone has holiness, if he is pure, if he has done mitzvot. In other words, if he showed acts of kindness is what that, is what that means when you're speaking about mitzvot. Good deeds. He's done like the widows. Jesus says you, you let off the greater matters. You left off caring for the widows and, and the poor. You neglected them. See? Now, he will smell each other. Uh, uh, excuse me. Let me get past that right there. I thought it was interesting when he said he smelled to see if he really has a true uh, fear. Um, uh, let's see here. He won't say, here you are. You have, uh, let's see, you have, you have a kippah. So like that, you can, you, can, you can go in not like that. He actually also speaks about, he says, it doesn't matter if you have a beard. He actually is he's, he's hitting on everything that, that the rabbis there are standing for, the beard, the, the kippah, all the, all the man-made traditions. He says he doesn't care about any of those things. He says that's not what he's looking for. He says it's not like that. That's what he tells him. It's not like that. All right. He says, I mean, really, he will have a certain, I um, can't make out the word because of the white paper. He said he will be able to feel what is truly inside of every person. Imagine that. Yeshua knows the secrets and the thoughts and intents of our heart. He said, I ask you once again, uh, is this all? He's asked, he wants to know, did he receive all of this from where he was at? He says, and he, he, he confirms that. Everything that he saw was from the place that he had went to, the place he had seen. You know, friends, I know there's probably no doubt a lot of people are going to be very critical of what this young man saw. But one thing's for certain, for certain, we do have a Gog and Magog war coming. And regardless of who we think it is that's coming against Israel, as far as when we look at Gog and Magog, clearly the Bible says all nations come against Israel. So whether or not one person might think it's Turkey or somebody thinks it's Russia, or in this case here, he said it was revealed to him that it was Obama leading this war. We do know that there's coming an all-out war between the nations, and they are fighting over one thing, and that's Israel. Even this young man saw that. It is true. We've been speaking about this now for weeks. They're going to fight over who gets the oil. But I forgot all about the fact that the world does unite to come against Israel as well. I didn't put those two pieces of the puzzle together. I knew that the world comes against Israel. I've preached about it for years now. I know all the nations come. I always said it was the United Nations that does it. And yet we see that the, that the world fights against each other. We can see all these things. And we see that they're ready to fight each other over the oil in the Middle East. But I didn't realize they would fight, come to a truce, and then turn against Israel. That's where your division of the land comes from. It wasn't dividing it between the Palestinian and the Jews. Just like it says in Ezekiel 35, these two nations will be mine. That's what Esau says. That's what Edom says, the Roman Catholic Church. And he divides it up between the nations over who gets what. All along while these things are happening, as this war prepares to take place, the two witnesses have got to be on the scene. They, they must be here somewhere now. Somewhere in this world, the two witnesses are here. I'm only waiting to see when they step on the scene. Somebody to straighten out this mess, this doctrinal mess the world is in. Of course, now we do know the Bible says the world will hate these two. You imagine that. Try to bring the truth and the whole world hates you for it. That's what's going to happen to them. Many people say, I can't wait, Brother Stephen, until the two witnesses get here. I always try to let them know, but they're going to be hated. What side will you be on? It's amazing. Even in a case like this here, when we stand with Israel, who do we stand for when we stand with Israel? We're standing for those humble-hearted Jewish people that do love the Lord. From within their heart, they love the Lord. These are the people that we should stand with. Because we know not everybody that claims to be Jewish are going to go in. But even as believers in Yeshua, we will see the Messiah standing there. I want to be there on that day. 
I want to stand with our Lord and our King, Yeshua, with a pure heart, a holy heart. I want to stand with those Jewish people that really do love God. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Shalom. Good evening. God bless you. Pray. Pray like you never prayed before. I would, I'll, I'll, I've got this, I'll post this video on Israeli News Live on our Facebook page. I'll put a link here on when we load this on YouTube for those of you that are watching on YouTube so that you can see this for yourself as well. I think, especially even for young people, it would do good for young people to see because this young man in the earlier part of the video talks about his shame that he felt. He said, because everything you do wrong, you're going to see it. He said, but what determines where you end up? He said, is what side you stood on, basically. Repentance is what we need, friends. Shalom and good evening.